them was ratified when? Who? When? When was, when was Alabama founded and we had our Constitution? 1819. How long was it before the first gun rights in the bridge of the curve? Who? Go ahead and sit down. Give it up. How long was it? Anybody remember? Anybody remember Slate versus Reed? 1840. That's when they took away our ability to carry a concealed weapon. 1840. So we uh, we were formed as a state in 1819, 1840. They took away our right. 21 years all it took for the first improvement. Can't carry concealed. Look it up. State versus Reed is an interesting case. This next lady I'm going to introduce is one that I am uh, very pleased to know. Beth Alcazar. Most of y'all know her. She's a Savior, I promise you save her for just a second. Award-winning author, she's an editor, blogger, and instructor. Beth has enjoyed more than two decades of teaching and working in the farm venture in industry. She holds degrees in language arts, education, and communication management, and uses her experience and enthusiasm to share safe and responsible firearms ownership and usage with others. She is a certified force science analyst with Force Science Institute and holds certifications with the NRA as a training counselor, chief range safety officer, and certified instructor for multiple disciplines. She is also a certified instructor through the Addis Institute, Draw School ICE Training, and Sig Sire Academy, and is USCCA certified instructor and senior training counselor. She enjoys representing her state as the Alabama Director of the D.C. Project and as a member of the Battle Carry Board. She most often describes herself as just a mom with a gun. And in her spare time, she enjoys baking and competitive shooting and hopes that her AR-15 handling is as smooth as her seven-layer chocolate cookie cheese. Cake. <laughs> By the way, she has also agreed that next year, she will bake the cookies for our dessert. I'm not sure that's true, but it sounds good. I didn't agree to that, but I do enjoy baking, and maybe, I don't know, maybe I can be convinced. I, I do love cookies. I know that's kind of a funny joke. Maybe one day my AR-15 handling will be as smooth as my cheesecake, but I do love baking cheesecakes. There's something very magical about a cheesecake. Um, I always struggle trying to figure out what I'm going to talk about when I'm here at Amakari. You guys are awesome. I pump the energy here. I love being here. I feel like maybe you've heard me too many times, so it's like, great, this one again. What is she going to tell us about? Um, we've had some fun moments together, talking about the dangers of water. Remember how dangerous water is? Um, the statistic I shared years ago was that 100% of criminals share this in common. They've all had water. They've all had the intake of water. I know, it's amazing, right? Statistics and facts. you got to believe them. I've talked a little bit about how to deal with the anti-gun crowd. But, you know, this year there was something that was really important to me and I'm very passionate about. And even going to SHOT Show recently, y'all know the shooting, hunting, outdoor trade show. It's like such a big deal in the industry, and we had it again this year in Vegas. It was canceled the year before, thanks to pandemics, whatever. And this year it was interesting. I went to listen to the governor's forum, and there were several governors there. Governor Ivy was not present. No one's surprised. She did not go to Vegas. I'm, I'm, no one's surprised about that. But what was interesting to me is that one of the main questions being asked to these governors that were representing their states, what is the most important thing that anybody in the 2A industry, any advocates, any businesses, any instructors, any supporters, what's the most important, the number one thing that we can do right now to help support the industry, to help, keeping, help to keep the momentum going forward? And Governor Noam and actually 
several others basically said the same thing. We gotta get kids involved. We gotta teach our children. Hold it down in the back, please. We've got Thank to you. be able to have a future. We've got to be able to move forward. This is not the end, right? I mean, when we look around right now, we see folks maybe our age, maybe older, maybe a couple younger. There's not that much represented here. And I understand this might not be the most exciting thing for a young person to go to. But I sincerely hope that behind the scenes, away from the Freedom Conference, you are having your own Freedom Conference in your house every day. Teaching your children, your grandchildren, kids in the neighborhood, random folks, I don't care, teaching kids, teaching youth, teaching our future, how important the fight is right now. How important it is that we don't lose the right to protect what we love. Because, you know, it's, it's interesting to me, across the board, wherever I teach, wherever I'm speaking, people always have a, a, an interesting view of mom with a gun, you know? It was fun to go with Bama Carey not too long ago and speak for constitutional carry, speak for permitless carry, and run into all the moms demand action ladies. <laughs> that was really fun. It was, it was high on my list of things to do. <clears throat> What was so funny though is I was wearing like a polka dot outfit or something. It was polka dots, I think. It was a rain jacket. I had a polka dot rain jacket on. And I'd be bopping over to the restroom just to, you know, calm myself because I was going to speak. I was going to testify. Woo. I was getting ready. And in the restroom were all the red shirts. Mom's demand. And I was thinking, ooh, <laughs> this is going to be fun. But they all just smiled at me like, hey, it is so good to see you here. What is your name? Welcome. Are you coming to the committee? Are you testing? Oh, they were so interested. And I'm like, yes, I will be here. I'm going to represent women. I'm going to represent moms. And they're like, yeah, awesome. Sign my little name on the paper. March my way up there, and one of the very first things I was able to say is, hey, by the way, those moms do not speak for me. <laughs> and they don't speak for most of the women I know. Because gun rights are women's rights. Right. Gun rights are civil rights. Gun rights are human rights. Right. And they just kind of went, <laughs> <laughs> Watch out for the girl in the polka dot jacket, I guess, is what they learned. They were shocked. But it's great to be just a mom with a gun because what a neat platform that is. And what a great opportunity, opportunity that brings to be kind of the unexpected, I don't know, the, the anti-stereotype. I don't know, do I look like a firearms instructor? <laughs> don't answer that question. <laughs> it's okay. My son earlier said, Mom, you look like a Disney princess today. And I was like, oh. Is that a good thing? And he assured me, yes. It was meant for a compliment. Because I'm thinking, a 12-year-old boy telling his mom it looks like a Disney princess could be a dig. Right? Am I right? Okay. He, he's just like turning red back right now. But it's great to be a mom with a gun. It's great to have that platform. But even if you're not a mom, even if you're not a parent, if there are children in your life that you care about, and if there's a future for the Second Amendment that you care about, I just want to share some things about what main overriding messages, easy, simple messages we can share right now with our children to make sure that they're getting the important messages and they're not being influenced by their friends or the television or social media. Because that stuff is powerful, y'all. It's powerful in a devastating way, it is powerful. But going back to this funny thing about being a mom with a gun, a lot of times people are like, oh my gosh, I've got kids, so I can't have guns in my home. That's dangerous. That's so dangerous. I'm like, oh wow. I've got three reasons why I have gun in my house. Guns, plural, maybe. Three reasons. One is named Jaden, one is named Ian, and the other is named Noel. Those are my three most important reasons.
And that's the message that we need to continue to share with folks like Moms Demand Action. Because I would love to look them in the eyes and say, are you worth protecting? Are the children worth protecting? Would you not do anything in your power if your child was being attacked or hurt? It's hard to address that question, isn't it? But y'all keep that in mind, because a lot of folks who are anti-gun, they're not going to respond to our facts and our statistics and our figures. Like I shared earlier, those can be skewed so easily. And yeah, there might be logic behind it, and that's cool, but what I've shared before is it's got to be heart. Because that's where you win people. It's very rare you're going to win someone logically because there's not a lot of people that are going to rise to that occasion, especially on Facebook, but uh, that's another story. But you can win them with heart. You can win them with sincerity. You can win them with being genuine and real. And we can start early, and we can start with our kids. So here are just, again, 25 overriding themes, basic things we can start to instill inside the minds of our children. Some of them simple, some of them deep, some of them may require some long conversations into the night, but I'll let you do that on your own time. So here's one, don't play with guns, guns are not toys. Very simple, very easy, very powerful. Even for the youngest of children, can you tell a child, no, not a toy? Yes. And moms and dads, you've probably said that phrase so many times, you're, you don't ever want to hear it again. Not a toy. Don't touch. No. Not a toy. Don't touch. No. But it's the same philosophy that I'll twist on people who are against guns and, and ask them my famous question. Oh my gosh, you have guns in the home. Do you have an oven? <laughs> yes. Oh my gosh, how's your house not burned down? How are your children not burn victims right now? How, how is everything in your house not destroyed? Because you have this dangerous appliance in your home. Well, it's, I tell them not to touch it. Mmm, interesting. Oh, I train my children. Oh, okay. It's again, it's the same philosophy. And we can teach our kids even as young ones. Another one that goes with that, if adults aren't around, don't touch firearms. As your child gets older, you want them to respect firearms. You want them to be responsible and safe with guns. You want them eventually to learn, hopefully, how to use properly a firearm and hopefully proficiently as well. But there's still that stipulation. You don't do this if I'm not here. So it no longer becomes no, don't touch. It becomes, hey, leave it alone unless we're together on this. You know, partner with your child, whatever that age level is or whatever that understanding level is. Here's another one. Guns should be safely and securely stored, but sometimes they are not. We need children to understand that. They should be stored safely. But how many times are we reading about accidents, negligent discharges, terrible tragedies, here even in our own state, because of this? Even responsible gun owners are not safely securing a weapon. It's happening all the time. And what's the famous line? I thought it was unloaded. Tell your children guns should be stored safely, but that doesn't mean they will be. We want them to understand that adults sometimes screw up. You know? Trust, but verify. You know, we've got we've to have this mentality where there's respect and there's caution. When it comes to firearms, always wait for an adult to help you, teach you, and guide you. Super important, especially with these teenagers. Hey, want to see my dad's gun? Not a cool idea. Not a cool idea. And again, we're not trying to teach our kids, you can't have guns, ever touch them. No, no, we're teaching them, there's a progression to this. There's, there's a natural progression to this. There's a way to do this safely. There's a way to do this together. There's a way to do this in a way where we can all be responsible. They need to understand that mentality. Here's another one. Learn and understand the firearm safety rules. How many of you know the four universal safety rules? Go ahead, raise your hand, be proud. Yeah, raise two hands, awesome. Yeah, what? Come on, seriously. If you know the gun safety rules, let me see the hands. Kids can start to learn this. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty-three, twenty-
four or five. Okay, sometimes it just depends on the child, but you can teach them a very safe version, an easy version, a simple version that my son is dying to show you. Son, you wanna come up here and show everybody? I have used my own children as guinea pigs. Don't tell them. But we've tested a lot of things out on them. And sometimes those four universal safety rules can be kind of wordy. A little verbose maybe, yeah? Lots of words. Well, we've got a very simple version. Okay, so I'm gonna say it because he's gonna show both hands. Why don't I just hold the mic for you, ready? <laughs> little mic shy. Okay, ready? Safe gun. Safe direction, safe finger, safe target. Can your three-year-old memorize that? Heck yeah. Let's try it again. Safe gun, safe direction, safe finger, safe target. Now think about how that relates to the four safety rules. Safe gun meaning we're going to treat that gun how? Okay. Safe direction meaning what? See? Safe finger. And safe target? Bingo. Simple, right? And now we've made it in a, in a version, in a way that children can learn. And they're not going, always keep your booger hook off the big switch until you pick your nose. Come on, you know you, you know you've taught your kids that. Come on. No, no, no. Okay, you can stay there for a moment, son. I'm going to speed through a couple of these other ones because we don't have time. But here's some other ones. Follow the safety rules, no compromises. Not only teach them, follow. Right? This is, this is walk, walk, talk, talk, all the things all the time, not just when they're watching. Because they're always watching. And they're always listening. Believe me, when your little one picks up on words and uses them appropriately, also not appropriately, then you go, whoops. She also listened to certain uh, radio DJs that used inappropriate language and shared that. That was fun. Here's something else your kids can learn. Guns can be used for self-defense. They need to know that. Because they don't get taught that in school. And they certainly aren't being taught that in the media. Guns can be used for self-defense. And our children learn that from an early age. Mommy and Daddy, yeah, we go shoot competitions or we teach people, but we have firearms because we love you. It's because of love. I love that statement that I heard, I think, at the very first family care conference. I don't carry a gun because I hate what's in front of me. It's because I love what's behind me. Oh, that's exactly what it is. Because if something should happen, you know, we do the seatbelt move, right? We become a seatbelt and we protect our kids. You don't have to stand behind me. Guns can also be used to protect others. That's also just as, just as significant. Guns can be used for hunting. We have a very rich heritage and culture built on, around that. Guns can be used for competitive shooting sports. And kids can get involved with that. And who knows, maybe one day get a scholarship or something. So they can be on some kind of marksmanship team. I don't know. Not to put any ideas in anybody's head. Guns are not like what you see in TV and movies. Super important one. Super important. Our kids play video games. We play video games. What happens in video games? You never die and you never run out of ammo. Cool. Not real life. But we become so, you know, used to that. We become, that becomes ingrained in our little brains. And think about this. Little brains that are still developing can't tell the difference between the reality and the fantasy. They can't. They have not developed. There's not cognitive development yet to actually say they understand the difference. They, they know that Santa exists. They know that Santa and his reindeer are real just as much as I'm real standing in front of you right now. Right, everybody? Yes, of course. Of course they do. Other important lessons. Some people have caused accidents with guns or used them purposefully to hurt other people. It's not a fun one. But we need our kids to know that. 
not to create paranoia, but to develop preparedness and to help them understand the mindset and the difference between someone who has malicious intent versus someone who has good intent. Guns can be dangerous in dangerous hands. Agree? Absolutely. And again, what is this creating? This is creating reality. This is creating truth for our kids. Guns can be dangerous by themselves. Guns get up and kill people. There's such a thing as gun violence. No, 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 no. Guns can be dangerous. Guns can be violent in dangerous or violent hands. This personification of the inanimate object drives me bonkers. It takes away the responsibility. And we want our kids to understand the responsibility. Mistakes with guns have caused deadly consequences. They need to know that as well. Mistakes can have deadly consequences. It's not a game, it's not a toy, it's not like your Xbox. This is life, this is real. There's cause-effect relationships, and some of them are very detrimental. Guns don't need to be feared, but they need to be respected. Y'all, I love that one. And here's a little side note. The organization that has three letters that some of us have not talked a lot about today has a program where they teach children about guns. But do you know one of the tenets in their program is, run away. What does that teach my child about firearms? They're scary. They're dangerous. Do you want your children to learn that? I want my child to have a respect and have a caution, but not a fear. He should fear the person, not the tool. And that's important to me. That's a huge one in my book. Firearms are very powerful, but they are under human control. Firearms do not have brains. They do not have intent. They cannot think. And that's an important one. Using a gun safely takes training and practice. Agree? Just like anything. Darn it. It takes training and practice, dedication, hard work, focus. It takes focus. You don't just give up. One time and done. Kids can learn how to use guns, but it's different for everyone. There is no set age or time. I wish there was a magical door that opened up every time the child was ready to learn about guns and the light would shine down and the heavens would just, I mean, music, everything, trumpets blaring. Doesn't work like that. My oldest, she learned right around the age of 12. This one we exposed to guns very early on, but he was like, Ugh, guns are for, for big people. And then our little one is the Tasmanian devil. <laughs> she's not allowed to touch guns. She's eight, but she's not ready, okay? It's gonna be different for your child or for the child in your care or for the child that you're dealing with. I can't tell you any magic age because there's not one. I bet people say, well, my son was using a fire when he was three. Awesome. Mine was still eating her boogers. <laughs> okay? We're not going to go there with that one. She's too wild, okay? Not everyone has firearms. Why is that a good lesson? Not everyone likes firearms. Where are you going? You're not, you can't escape. Okay. Not everyone has them, not everyone likes them. Our kids need to know that message so that they understand that people are making their own decisions, making their own choices, that's okay. I'm not trying to force guns on my kiddos. I'm trying to give them a responsible, healthy view of firearms so they make good decisions. That's it. And then when they get to the proper age, they won't have their concealed carry permit. Anyway, um, firearms are a part of our American heritage. Agreed? Yep. They were so important. They were so important. They were specifically written in, specifically mentioned, specifically protected. That's huge. That's amazing. That's America right there. The Second Amendment protects our natural God-given right. It's not a right that I earned. It's not a privilege that I paid for. It's mine because I'm worth protecting. Firearms are a normal thing. I like that one. We need to teach our children that. 
Firearms are so normal in our house, our kids are bored with them. They're like, guns. Uh. My husband wrote an interesting article where this guy was so impressed with my daughter's new apron for work at a grocery store, even though an AR-15 was sitting out on the kitchen table. This guy was like, oh, a gun. Ooh, look at your apron. <laughs> yeah, interesting how that happens, though. But that's because they are taught that guns are normal. It's not taboo, it's not weird, it's not unspoken, it's completely normal. Firearms are for men and women alike. And you must be safe and responsible with and around firearms at all times. Those are just 25 simple, everyday things that you can incorporate into conversations when you're watching the news, maybe the kids are messing around with social media, you see something on television that you can address, and let me tell you, teach them often, teach them always, be consistent, be, be vigilant, because then they grow up and they're able to share with other people safety and responsibility. They're able to model that, they're able to perpetuate that. My son will tell you a little bit about the proof in the pudding. Now you have to talk in the microphone. So does firearms training for kids, do these 25 things work? Are they important? Uh, definitely important and I mean with all the exposure on video games and shows and all the stuff kids in my generation see it is extremely important to teach us the correct way to use that uh, if we grow up with the wrong way with the wrong idea from television and all that then the world is not going to be that great of a place, and protection is going to be very not or scarce. And the human po population might go. I don't know, <laughs> but kids, especially now, really do need to learn the importance of guns, with the danger in the world, and need to learn the correct way, because without them. We don't really have great options to protect ourselves. Poor Ian, that was not practice or planned. I just said, you want to say something? He's like, okay. Put him on the spot there. But just a reminder and just an encouragement because what we believe and what we see and what we experience and what we've done here in this room is pretty impressive. I mean, if you look around and think about the, the types of backgrounds and experiences that are represented here, it's pretty impressive. And, and it also covers every gamut. It covers everything in the spectrum that we could potentially think about. And this is even more so, exponentially more, in the gun community today. But as we age, if we're not bringing others in, if we're not sharing the message, if we're not insisting that our voices are heard, if we're not reaching out and making sure that the school board and superintendents and other people aren't messing with the kinds of education that we want our children to have, if they're closing doors, we need to find others to open. We need to make sure we ourselves are being the good role models and the good teachers for our children and for other children. Otherwise, as my son said, we could see the end of the ability or the end of the understanding or the end of the right for people to have this for protection. And again, that's what it's all about. Firearms, yeah, sure, they're fine. We might have a couple at my house. We might enjoy shooting. But what's really awesome at the end of the day is that I can look at pretty much anyone in this room or anyone in America and say, you know what? You're worth protecting. And they're gonna agree with me. And no matter where they're coming from, no matter what their ideals are, no matter what their values are, we now have something unified. We have something we can share. And that is an incredible starting point for knowledge. That's an incredible starting point for understanding. That's an incredible starting point 
for making a difference and spreading this to other people. So thank you to my son for sharing his two cents. I really appreciate that. Give him a round of applause. And hopefully we see more of this age group popping up at our meetings. And if they're bored at the meetings, I don't care. Give them a coloring page, something. Win them with the opportunities to continue to learn about guns, to go shoot them in safe and responsible ways. Make it something that we share together as families, and more importantly, that we share as community and Americans, because that's what, that's what unites us and brings us all together. When it all boils down to it, protecting what we love is what every single person that I've ever spoken with can agree with. And that's what we always have to remember for this. So get them involved, teach them often, teach them young, and maybe they'll turn out okay, right? There's hope. Okay, y'all, thank you very much. I'm done. You gotta cut the lights down, Brian. It is now just after midday. Colonel Smith and Major Pitt Karen look around. They see militia continuing to stream in from every direction. Their men are tired, they're hungry, running low on ammunition, and there's about 20 miles between them and the safety of their barracks back in Boston. They don't have any choice. They have to go. So Colonel Smith gets his men formed up, gets them started on the march back. He sends flankers out on each side to keep the militia back out of musket range. They clear one here at the hilltop, a few farmers' fields. Things are going pretty well for about the first mile. Then they come to a junction of several country lanes, a narrow bridge across a small stream. That stream forces the flankers down out of the hills and the tree lines allows the militia to close in. On those same country lanes, several militia units are arriving. There's elements of brigades from Chelmsford, Balearica, and Red Reading to the north, Framingham, and Sudbury to the south. American numbers are now over 1,000. Cravens and Smith's numbers for the first time this day. There are no fife and drums. The only sound is the tramp of the weary infantry as they march their way back. Suddenly, the quiet is broken by the sound of a musket shot. The rear guard of the British line turns, presents their muskets, and fires a volley. Up until this point, the militia have always acted in a defensive manner only firing when fired upon, and then only enough to stop the immediate attack. Not anymore. They've had enough. And they open fire with the fury of revenge and musket balls rain down on that British column, and it will not stop all the way back to Boston. The third strike of the match. This time it blazes forth, and it lights the fuse on the war for independence that will burn for eight bloody years and cost thousands of lives. As they continue to march along, the column takes more casualties. Places like Hardy's Hill and Bloody Angle. The column, as I said, is about eight miles long. The rear element will no, no longer clear one ambush. Then the lead elements encounter another. They are now approaching the boundary between Lincoln and Lexington. To the south, the ground is low and wet. To the north, is pastures studded with granite boulders. Beyond the pastures, steep, rocky terrain. 
the road head towards that hill, turn south to go around it. On that hill is a militia with a score to settle. Captain Parker and his men have regrouped and taken up position on that hill, many of them still wearing the bloody bandages from that morning encounter. Captain Parker will wait for the British column to approach very closely and when Colonel Smith himself rides into view, he orders his men to fire. Colonel Smith tumbles out of his saddle with a, th what, a thigh wound. Major Pitcairn takes over command. We know this place today is Parker's Revenge. A little further down the road, at Fisk Hill, Major Pitcairn is thrown off his horse. He's not injured, but the wind is knocked out of him and he's unable to command for a while. With the command structure broken down, discipline deteriorates in the ranks. Some of the men sit down on the side of the road. They've had enough. I'm not going anymore. There are fights breaking out at streams, water wells, and even puddles. Others are running off. The officers get around and threaten them with their bayonets. Just when it looks like it's about the end of the British forces, from the lead elements, we can hear cheers as they're entering into Lexington. That relief column by General Hugh Percy had finally, finally arrived. General Percy has a couple of cannon with him. He sets them up on either side of the road and they approach the town. Fires off a round. One of those rounds goes through the town meeting house, sending splinters in all directions. This is the first time the militia have encountered cannon fire and it halts them immediately. Gives Colonel Smith's men a chance to finally struggle into Lexington and get some much needed rest. General Percy cannot believe his eyes as Colonel Smith's once proud men straggled into town, bleeding, beaten, bloody, exhausted, and spent. General Percy now has a much larger force with the combination of Colonel Smith's men. He has about 1,800 soldiers now, but he's still in a precarious position. There's yet some 15 miles to go back to Boston. He left in a hurry because he was late. He did not bring any extra supply wagons, so he only has what carried on the cannon side boxes. His men carry the same powder and ball for 36 rounds, so they will soon be running low on ammunition. In Lexington, the militia also pick up a new commander, Brigadier General William Heath. General Heath is a self-described corpulent, balding gentleman farmer. For those of you that don't know what corpulent means, he liked his business in great. <laughs> General Heath had a passion for tactics. He could often be found in Henry Knox's bookstore in Boston studying the subject. Whenever the, offer, whenever the opportunity arose, he would engage British officers and discuss tactics. General Heath has come up with this plan that he calls the Circle of Fire. It involves fresh, fresh soldiers at the lead of the column. After the column passes by, those soldiers will break off, circle around back, resupply, and take up new positions as the head of the column. Somewhat difficult to command, especially with several militia units that have never fought together and none of them ever under the command of General Heath, but it will work quite well for this day. About 3.15, General Percy begins his march on to Boston. The militia quickly move out to surround the British column. At first, the circle is incomplete. General Heath sends couriers out to intercept militia units arriving from distant towns and redirects them further east to the head of the column. Some of the towns are sending boys on horses with saddlebags filled with supplies. Others have wagons with food and ammunition to support the militia. The heaviest fighting, the bloodiest battles occur in Monotomy. Monotomy is present day Arlington. It becomes more of a house to house urban type conflict there. Residents knowing full well what will happen to them Either step out the front door and shoot at that column or just shoot from the window as soon as they do. British soldiers rush the house and kill everyone inside. Women, children, non-combatants, doesn't matter. General Heath's plan, I'm sorry, General Percy's plan is to go back down through Cambridge the way he came out. To do that means he has to cross the Cambridge Big Bridge at the Charles River. His scouts have told him that bridge has been sabotaged. The militia have pulled up all the planks off of that bridge. Besides, even if he can get across it, he knows he's just going to find a whole new batch of militia just waiting for their chance to get into this fight. So acting on some information from a local Tory, he makes a desperate left turn, breaks through the circle of fire, and goes up an obscure path called Kent Lane. He's headed up for Charlestown Neck to get into Charlestown. This unexpected left turn disrupts the balance of power for a little bit until the circle of fire can regroup. 
And the militia has one last chance to stop Percy's advance. There's a unit commanded by Colonel Timothy Pickering that if he moves out quickly, can stop General uh, Percy in his advance. But Colonel Pickering was not really ready for a war with England just yet. And he delayed his departure. And that allowed General Percy and his men to make it into Charlestown, where they are now under the protective fire of the HMS Somerset, and they collapse in exhaustion. General Hugh Percy had once boasted that he could take the entire North American continent with two company of grenadiers. He changed his tune a little this day, and he would write, any man who dares to look upon them as an irregular mob will find himself much mistaken. They have men amongst them who know very well what they are about. John Adams took a ride down Battle Road the next day on the 20th of April. He witnessed the carnage, the burial parties, the stench of the burning buildings. And he would write, Posterity, you will never know how much it cost the present generation to preserve your freedom. I hope you will make good use of it. If you do not, I shall repent in heaven that I ever took half the pains to preserve it. Do you think we're making good use of it? General Washington first got word of this day he was in his fields. He quietly left his fields, gathered up his gear, and he would write to a friend. Unhappy it is to reflect that a brother's sword has been sheathed in a brother's breast, and the once happy and peaceful plains of America are either to be drenched in blood or inhabited by a race of slaves. Sad alternative. But can a virtuous man hesitate in his choice? I'll leave you with this. It's a little over a year later, it's now December of 1776. Things are not going so well for the American colonies, for General Washington and his Continental Army. They've been beaten time and again, pushed back into Pennsylvania. Several thousand of General Washington's troops had already gone home. Several thousand more, their enlistment is up at the end of the month. Any of you history buffs out there might know what happened on Christmas Day in 1776. Washington needed his soldiers. He needed to boost their morale. The living conditions were lousy. He needed them to re-enlist. He needed others to come to the cause. There was a man that Chris Ann Hall talked about a little bit named Thomas Paine. Thomas Paine wrote that pamphlet entitled The Crisis. The whole thing prints out in about five pages. And she showed you a little bit of the beginning of it. General Washington had that read to his troops on the 23rd of December. The whole first paragraph goes like this. These are the times that try men's souls. The summer soldier and the sunshine patriot will, in this crisis, shrink from the service of their country. But he that stands by it now deserves the love and thanks of man and woman. Tyranny, like hell, is not easily conquered, yet we have this consolation with us. The harder the conflict, the more glorious the triumph. What we obtain too cheap, we esteem too lightly. It is dearness only that gives everything its value. Heaven knows how to put a proper price upon its goods, and it would be strange indeed if so celestial an article as freedom should not be highly rated. Britain, with an army to enforce her tyranny, has declared that she has the right not only to tax, but to bind us in all cases whatsoever. And if being bound in that manner is not slavery, is there not such a thing as slavery upon earth? Even the expression is impious, for so unlimited a power belongs only to God. I submit to you that this freedom, this liberty that we enjoy today, we obtain too cheap and we esteem it too lightly. And if we don't change that, I'm going to be sitting there one day, several of us are going to be sitting there one day with our grandchild sitting on our knee. And they're going to look up at me and say, Grandpa, what was it like to be free? Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes my talk. Thank you very much. Very honored to have this opportunity. Thank you for the board of Manly County. Hope you all have a wonderful weekend.
Now you gotta suffer through me before we get to the prizes. Ain't that exciting, huh? I believe this is our best, best problem I could figure out. I believe this is our seventh conference. I believe that's correct. Uh, how many, is anyone traveled a hundred, over a hundred miles to get here? Ah, uh, you don't count up there. Over 120? Over 130? Nobody over 130? How far did you come, Kim? Uh, 200 and something. You left at 3.30 this morning, didn't you, huh? I left at 3. 3 o'clock this morning. Stand up, would you please? Here she is. Y'all know her. She posted all on Facebook. And let me tell you what. She is a bamboo slit that's sliding up under these resident representatives' fingernails. I'm telling you, she is, she is. Just a few little things before we get to the prizes. It's been a long journey, guys, to get where we are today. Ten years, and we're just about to have a bill to the floor of the house. Uh, there's been a lot of ups and downs. Some of you may know that Bank Carey split off from another group. We were all in this group together, not all of us, but a good many of us. And one of the leaders of the other group actually stated to a news reporter at a public hearing in Montgomery, we need to regulate long guns because we don't need to be people to be out carrying them around. It was then we realized we had to, that Bible Carey had to come out from what was to become the ashes of the other group. You can't say you're no compromise and say that. I say that to say this, choose who you align yourself with wisely. A lot of water has gone on the bridge since then. What was that, 2011, Paul? Yeah. 20, 2011, maybe? Oh, We've all learned a lot, and we're still learning together. Just know that there are many who will mislead you, and when they get some power, it just gets worse. Power corrupts, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Amen. We cannot forget that. There's still a lot of ground to cover, but one thing you can remain confident in, Bama Carey is about the Second Amendment the way our founders intended. We are about our own Alabama Declaration of Rights, Section 26, which Chris had referred to, which is protected by Section 36. We are not about compromising. We are about calling out those who are against freedom. We are about recruiting and educating those who will join the fight and not give up. We are about not giving up until the last shot is fired. We are about preserving every one of our rights by saving gun rights. We know that is liberty's teeth. We know without them, it's only a short time away from total government control. I pray that you will continue this journey with us, and today I hope that you have a renewed fire in your soul to tell others and recruit others. Because through education, we can prevail, and through holding our legislators accountable, we, we can prevail. HB 272, the House bill, should be on the floor of the House Tuesday. If any of you can attend, please do so. I can promise you it will be frustrating. It will make you angry. If you've never listened in to what they do and how they do it, you'll be surprised. What can I say about HB 272? When it goes on the floor Tuesday, we will have done all we can do to make it happen. You have called. You've emailed, you've texted, you've worn them out, tell them what we want. In the end, they write the laws. But wait, in the end, we will fit them in and out of office. <laughs> this being election year, we have a better chance of passing something good than we've ever had. Will it be perfect? No, it will not. Will I be completely happy with it? Probably not. But hopefully, it'll be some steps in the right direction, and we have got to keep our pressure on with our contacts. A lady sent me a text the other day. She said, I sent 26 emails this morning. 
One of our group leaders told me, a group leader, last night, I believe, it took him about an hour and a half to make phone calls every day. An hour and a half. That's not too much to ask for liberty, but I was impressed. After this is over, those who have opposed our gun rights and our liberties, we must hold them accountable at every turn. They must never go to a meeting without being called out about their vote. We'll make them public. You don't have the names to follow through with. We have got to make believers out of them. We have got to make them understand that they will be held accountable. I want them to say, crap. Who did I steal that from? Somebody else said that. Anyway, I want to say, crap. We can't do anything without those guys getting on us. That's what I want to hear. That's what I want to hear. We should do our best to make them feel like what hits the trail behind the buffalo if they cross us. And so we shall. I hope y'all are with me, us, on that, because it's you that do this, it's not me. I just happen to be up here, but it's, it's not me, guys. If it weren't for y'all, we couldn't do nothing. We couldn't do anything. We can talk about it, HB 272 and Senate bill that's coming out. Uh, they're waiting to put it on the floor of the Senate to see if it's going to match. Let's see if I can say this right. Senate Bill 1 will be substituted as it goes to the Senate floor by an exact copy of what comes out of the House. As long as they don't water it down so bad, it's not a good bill. If it comes out of the House and it's something that we can all live with, then Senate Bill 1 will magically transform into the same thing that House Bill 272 is when it goes to the floor of the Senate. It's interesting how things work because we can pass a bill and when it's brought up, they say, I'm going to substitute that bill and it can be changed to something else. If we get that done, it won't have to go back through the House. It'll be a done deal when the Senate passes. But if something happens, we don't know what happens. They're telling me that the uh, debates will go on into the night Tuesday because they are really fighting. Your phone call will make a difference until it's passed or voted down. So that's, that's the best I can do on it right there. Now, let's get to what you've probably all been waiting on. We have got a ton of prizes up here and the, and the list has grown. Uh, where's Gene at? Oh, here he is. Okay. Uh, Beth, y'all know who Beth, that's okay. You need to come here and have bring Sean with you. We need some help. And Ian and he too. We need some help up here. Yeah, everybody's got their tickets in the basket, right? Okay, the way this is going to work, and it's going to move real quickly, is that we're going to draw tickets out of here, and we're going to give you a prize. We ask that you hustle up and get down here and get it. When we get through drawing for all the prizes, except for the pistols, we're going to put all those tickets right back into the barrel and stir them up again. So at the end of the day, everybody's going to have a dog in the hunt for the three pistols. Okay? Don't turn so fast and shake that tape off that one, <laughs> So uh, the first lady's name we draw is going to get this red bag right down here. Okay? The red bag is for a lady. All right? Okay. Uh, what you got, Paul? Okay, a goodie bag? Yes. From Donald's America, number 8379. Last four digits, 8379. 8379. Claim in a hurry or we're going to call somebody else. Of course, we could take Mike from the Eighty-four seventy-two. Eighty-four seventy-two. Eighty-four seventy-two. Come on down, Ron. Eighty-four seventy-two. Hey, she gets that red bag. First, first lady gets called. Show me what's in it. Show me what's in it. It's, it's a firearm purse. Is what it is. Don't take that. We're not going to do all these this way. But. Oh, we might. Yeah, what's, what, 
Is that a t-shirt? Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh. Well, thank you. How oh, she is. <laughs> 8416 is the next one. No, you keep your ticket, honey. You keep your ticket. Yeah, that, that'll be good again. We're going to put it right back in there. 8416, what you got in front of there, Paul? Got your paint hat. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Sean, get the prize or something. You're supposed to keep that. How about the T-Mag? All right, I got a T-Mag here. Number 8397. 8397 for a P-Mag. Woo! There you go. James, you need one to go with that slate full of them you got, don't you? Alright, a uh, what? A solo cook unit. I don't really know what that is. 82, 88, 82, 88. It's from Hoover Tactical. It's got to be good. 82, 88. Where's he coming? Way in the back. 82, 88. Oh. Eighty-two, eighty-eight. Here you go, Paul. Oh. Eighty-two, eighty-three. What you got? Take it. Yeah. Eighty-two, eighty-three. Eighty-two, eighty-three. Is that you? Eighty-two, eighty-three. Here you go. You got it. Let him come up here and try and get a picture made of him. What you got? Got a LED flashlight. Eighty-one oh six. Eighty-one oh six. Everybody likes flashlight. Come around, get you. You can't be ticket, then you all right. We got a knife here and a uh, what's that what's that with it? 8119. Oh everybody, this is a ticket and splinter remover. 8119 and a knife. 8119. That man's got splintered all over him. He's in the front. Or maybe it's ticks, huh? What you got? Magazine loader number 8350. I think that's from Hoover Tactical too, isn't it? 8350, 8350. There she is, come on down there, all the way from Bill <laughs> She's the only one here that could probably jog up here and not get out of her head. <laughs> Paul Revere's ride. This is from uh, the Apple Project, 8387. 8387. 8387. Can you call another ticket for that one, please? Yeah. I'm at the seat. You don't look like an apple seed. Oh, I'm sorry. Got you covered. Okay. Uh, pick him out another. Give, give him the, the gun over the thing there. There you go. Take that one. 83, 87. That's right. Finally, somebody gets excited. All right. We're going to give away that book again. You got it. Okay. Number 83, 84. 83, 84. We're going to put your ticket back in there for the good. <laughs> Alright, we're going to move away from the 83 and go to 8109. 8109. 8109 for the book. Ah, right, here she comes. 8109. A block range back. This is from Hoover Tactical. 8091. 8091. There he is. Okay, we've got a survival kit here. This is 8336. 8336. You can't survive without a survival kit. 8336. There it is. 
65. Come on, I know y'all got 1911s in this room. <laughs> 8265. There he is. Cool. He may be old, but he's a little slow. Maybe that's a little more different. I don't know. Either way, you're running. Okay, here's a random goodie bag. Value is $836 on this one. Oh, they like to actually believe that. 8386. 8386. Oh, wow. I got to pump it up. Thanks, sir. Number 8432. 8432. Got your goodie bag. 8432. We're going to give you something else. 8432. There you go. There you go. Keep it All right. We're going to try the goodie bag one more time. Number 8295. 8295. There it comes. Yeah. Leave a bit, too. He can open that up and show what he got there. He don't mind. I like to open up the show with everybody. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You're not ashamed to block. Turn around and show that. I actually own it. I do a little bit. Hey, why don't you try a moment? Let's see. Hey, keep it going. It's real. You got a range bag from Hoover Tactical number 8243. 8243. By the way, that's a repurposed gift right there. That was here a couple of years ago. I don't think they've been worn much though. I got a crazy knife here. Number 8075. 8075. Here she comes. Number 8075. Got another goodie bag here for number 8395. 8395. 8395. Oh, here the table. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, yeah. We didn't get those one. Can you give away one or both of them? One ticket, one ticket. Yeah, that's $85. Yeah, okay. All right, we got a ticket to an Apple Street event. This is a $75 dealer right here. Uh, number 8377. 8377. Eighty-three seventy-seven. There he is. Yeah, I'll make a cooking kit. All right, got another cooking kit from Hoover Tactical. Eight zero six two. Eight zero six two. Eight zero six two. There he is. All right, we got a goodie bag from Gun Owners. You let him do something. Good back from uh, Gumballs of America, number 8135. Oh, there you go. Yes. By the way, while I'm thinking about it, if you're a Battlefield member, you can buy a Battlefield membership and a Gumballs of America membership at a $5 reduced rate. They give us a reduced rate. So for 40 bucks, you can be Gumballs of America and a Battlefield. That's something that they do for us. I don't know if they do that for anybody else, Jordan? No. Nah, they love us. That's why they do that. Uh, what do I got here? Uh, nails to holster book. Heels to holster book. Heels to holster book. I don't know I got nails. I guess I'm looking for your beard. Number 8302. Heels to holster book. Number 8302. 8302. Oh, we got it. Plasma lighter. Okay, plasma lighter here and a compass. 8114, 8114, 8114. Everybody needs a plasma lighter and a compass. 8114. We got some people coming home. I hope y'all will tell them that they missed the prize. 
All right, we'll try again, number 8365. 8365. There it is. There we go. Well, we've got, got a t-shirt. Make Armed Citizens Great Again t shirt number 8438. 8438. What'd you. I don't want a t shirt. Jim. He's going to be winning a t shirt already. Nope, you're out. There you go, there's a tank hat. Johnny, you don't know worry. We got this other Johnny. Okay. Johnny. That'll be fine. That's a good one. That's a $75 rating. All right, come on. Decision, decision. Pick a way to get to the pistol. <laughs> All right, we'll give away a uh, Johnny Appleseed uh, ticket here for number 8438. 8438. 
They might have really got deep in here. Uh, 8491. 8491. There you go. That man told me for us today he wanted a signed copy of Chris Ann's book. There you go. Now we got a Chris, a, uh, what is that called? It's a DVD from Chris Ann, number 8105. 8105. Is that you? Yay! There you go. I probably don't believe you know this, this lady right here and her husband is the one that donated one of the pistols up here for us. Well, you don't like me to say anything, but, you know, he only had two, and he had to give up one, so. Let's get busy and call Michael Stone Call. Thank y'all for coming.